Good morning, everyone. So we've seen that. So as usual, I want to start off with some product updates. And again, these are no new uh, sites of actions, acts of ingredients, just mixtures of different things. So the first product update I want to tell you about that's available is a product from Syngenta called Storin. This is a mixture of dual Callisto, Zidua, and Optogen, which is a bicyclopyrone product. It is one of your typical corn pro products, field corn, seed corn, sweet corn, and popcorn. You can apply this product either pre-plant, pre, or early post, or you can do split applications. You really want to, if you're applying this product alone, you want to target it before the weeds reach three inches, especially if you're doing an early post application. And be mindful, uh, early post applications for this product are only allowed for field corn and seed corn. Can't do it, can't spray it on sweet corn or popcorn. If you're going to do a split application, um, it's recommended that you do about a half to a third of the rate pre-emergence followed by a third to half the rate post-emergence. You can't apply this with any liquid fer fertilizers and you can't exceed a maximum of 2.4 quarts per application per year. Um, this is a product that actually did have a chance to look at this past summer as a pre-emergence study. And what we did was we looked at Storin at 1.2 quarts, uh, 1.2 quarts with plat atrazine, 2.4 quarts, 2.4 quarts with plat atrazine, your, your similar practices, and we looked at how that would compare to Acuron and Bicep. Mind you that 1.2 quart rate, right, pre-emergence is uh, for a split application. But overall, pre-emergence control, everything looked really good for the most part on all of my week weed control studies at the Y, I rated Lamb's Quarters, Morning Glory, and Foxtail, which all give us a good representation of small seeded broadleaves, large seeded broadleaves, and uh, grasses in Foxtail. But again, good control with all of these treatments. Storin with and without atrazine was really comparable to Acuron and Bicep, either at the 1.2 quart rate or the 2.4 quart rate. After we applied a post-emergence treatment to this, this study, which again consisted of another uh, 1.2 quarts of Storin, followed by Roundup, Halex GT, Roundup alone, or um, Acuron followed by Acuron plus Roundup, got really good control of Lamb's Quarters, Morning Glory, over 95%, or Lamb's quarter, excuse me, foxtail, over 95% with those treatments. Where we saw a decline in treatment was with our morning glory control. Um, but I wanted to point out that a lot of these uh, treatments, these post treatments, in included Roundup. And Roundup just isn't a great morning glory herbicide. So unless you have something else in that post emergence tank mix to control the morning glory, you're not going to see the best control. The next two products I want to talk about, um, Calibra and Coyote, Calibra from Syngenta and Coyote from UPL, um, they're similar. They both have Dual and Callisto as their active ingredients. However, uh, Calibra has a lower ratio of, ratio of Dual and Callisto compared to Coyote, which is 3.34 compared to 2.82 Dual and 0.33 uh, Callisto com compared to 0.28 in Calibra. Again, this is a, these two are both corn herbicides labeled for pre-plant and pre-emergence applications. The rates on these products vary, again, due to that difference in the ratio of those active ingredients. Like Storin, if you're going to make a post-emergence application with this, you can only apply, apply it to field corn and, sweet corn and seed corn. Similar rules apply as far as weed size. You want to spray it when those weeds are small and you don't want to spray Calibra before it reaches the eight, or Coyote, before they reach the eight leaf stage. You can also make, there is um, information about split application on the Calibra label. I did not see any information about 
it on, the, on the Coyote label, label. But again, Calibra, like Storin, if you're doing split application, half to a, half to a two thirds of the rate pre followed by the rest of the rate post. Another interesting thing about these two products was that with Calibra, like Storin, it says that you cannot apply it with any liquid fertilizers. However, with Coyote, lang label language says you must do a compatibility test before applying it with liquid fertilizers and do not exceed the total n amount of uh, required application percentage per year. Now, I d have not had a chance to look at Calibra, but I have looked at Coyote the past couple of years. And this particular study, we looked at uh, Coyote and Atrazine Pre, followed by Roundup. We also looked at a single post-emergence treatment with just Coyote, Atrazine, and Roundup. And we compared that to Corvus, Atrazine, and Princep, followed by Roundup, as well as uh, Atrazine and Simazine, followed by Acuron GT. And for all four of those treatments, as you can see for our results, this is 46 days after the pre-emergence treatments and the post-emergence treatments had already been applied. Everything looks good. Everything's above 95% control. But what really stood out in this particular study was this single post-emergence treatment of corn, Corvus, of, excuse me, Coyote, Atrazine, and Roundup, these yellow bars on your graph. So this is what the study looked like before I made that post-emergence application. Just a mess of uh, lamb's quarters, morning glory, and some foxtail. And this is what the study looked like after that. Basically, almost, com almost completely clean in July. So that just goes to show us that, yes, we can make a sing it, do a one-pass application and control a lot of our problems with the post-emergence herbicide. And that'll, be, that'll come up later in this talk. A couple other products I just want to mention. There's a new product from Corteva called uh, Cairo. This is a mixture of Warrant Impact and Stinger. This is another corn herbicide, but um, you're only allowed to make a single post-emergence application. You can apply it up to, 20, up to 60 ounces, and you can even apply it from emergence up to 24-inch corn. Can apply it with fertilizers, and just be aware that there's a 45-day pre-harvest interval for ears and forage, and a 60-day pre-harvest interval for corn stover. Uh, New Farm has come out with a lot of uh, post-patent products recently. Um, there's a new Carfentrazone product called Longbow that's available. Carfentrazone is AIM, and it's registered for uh, several crops. There's also a new rim sulfuron product, th thyphen sulfuron product called Leopard. If any of you have ever sprayed Resolve Q on your crop, uh, that's the same product. Um, Cloak and Cloak EX, if any of you have ever used Canopy or Canopy EX on your soybeans, um, those are similar products. And there's also Scorch. Scorch is a mixture of dicamba, 2,4-D, and fluoroxapir. Those are all grape, group four herbicides. And if you n remember, group four herbicides are the ones that target broadleaves. So this product can be sprayed on pretty much anything that isn't a broadleaf crop and isn't soybeans. You can spray it on, you can spray it in corn, wheat. You can also, it's also labeled for uh, conservation reserve plantings. And just as another aside, um, just be aware that there are a lot of new clethodin products out there on the market. Uh, Select Max is probably the one you're most familiar with. Just be aware that uh, there are different uh, concentrations of clethodim in each of these products. Clethodim is about one pound. Shadow is a two pound product. And Shadow EC is a three pound product. What does this mean? It's just going to. It, it matters for how much you actually apply per acre. So, you know, with Select Max, you're going to apply about 12 ounces per acre. With Shadow, higher amount of clethodim, only apply six ounces per acre. Shadow EC, 
lower than that, you're only going to apply about four ounces per acre. So the higher the percentage of clethodim in these products, the less you're going to have to apply. So let's move on to something different. So let's talk about the Endangered Species Act and some issues that uh, you should be aware of going forward. Now, we should all know what FIFRA is. FIFRA is the law that allows us to spray pesticides. Many of us should also be familiar with the Endangered Species Act, because it's only about 50 years old. And this is the federal law that's designed as a conservation program to protect endangered species and their habitats. The Endangered Species Act is administered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. FIFRA is administered by the EPA. Now, a formal consultation is required any time the EPA takes any action that may affect a listed species or its critical habitat. Labeling pesticides, any changes to pesticide labels, are considered an act that the EPA must take to uh, get a formal concentration to register these pesticides. EPA has failed to comply with this. In fact, in the past decade, it's only met these obligations of consulting with these other services about 5% of the time. This has resulted in about 20 lawsuits, and I'm sure Paul has the details of those lawsuits, and he'll be glad to share them with you. The problem with these errors an issue is that these ESA requirements are ironclad. There's not really a whole lot of wiggle room with the Endangered Species Act. No politician is going to touch the Endangered Species Act. It's not going to change. And the fortunate thing with the Endangered Species Act, it really does not consider benefits. FIFR considers a risk-benefit analysis when registering pesticides. Endangered Species Act only considers risks to endangered species and their habitat. So, uh, EPA has decided to implement a new policy as with regards to the Endangered Species Act and FIFRA. Um, most of these are mitigations that are going to be restrictions added to pesticide labels to help reduce those impacts. The goal is to help reduce future jeopardy findings and reduce future co consultations and require future, fewer mitigation steps in the future. Basically, with these mitigations, EPA is trying to say, we are, try we are trying, doing our best to follow the law as far as complying with the requirements of the Endangered Species Act. And these strategies for pesticides are forthcoming. Um, one of them is there's going to be strategies for all pesticides, um, herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, the herbicide strategy is the one that's just been worked on first. Um, this strategy will outline how EPA plans to meet these obligations and what you are and farm, as farmers are going to be responsible for. This is going to start with determining pesticide use limitation areas or PLUAs. You can find these on Endangered Species Protections Bulletin or Bulletins to Live, which I'll cover in the next slide. Um, then you'll see mitigation measures based on how close you are to an endangered species ha habitat. Basically, if you're within like a thousand feet of spraying a pesticide, these mitigation requirements are going to be. Uh, added to all new products as well as re-registrations. And keep in mind that pesticides are re-registered about every 15 years. So eventually you're going to see all these changes on your labels. These are going to, there is going to be a mitigation point requirement for this. But you must show that, and this mitigation point requirement basically is saying that as a farmer, you must show that you are putting suitable practices on your farm corresponding to the number of points on, a, on the label to use a, a particular herbicide. And points are going to vary for each qualifying practice. You might have two points for having a no-till. You might have three points for having a cover crop, etc. 
Basically, the greater the risk to the endangered species habitat, the more points are required. <coughs> and there should be eventually all of this information posted on one of their websites. So let's talk a little bit about those pesticide use limitation areas. So on label and on some labels now, there's going to be somewhere in the directions for use se section information that tells you when using this product, you must follow measures contained in the Endangered Species Protection Bulletin for the area in which you are applying this product. You have to obtain this bulletin no more than six months before using this product. So how do you obtain this bulletin? There's a website. It's called Bulletins 2 Live. What you do is you go on this website, you select your location, the location of your farm, when you, when you plan to apply whatever pesticide you want to apply, you enter the registration number and it will give you something, a printout, and it'll show you some shaded area. Hopefully, you'll get a printout that looks like this. And this printout there are no shaded areas in this map, so there's no pesticide use limitation areas. If you happen to use a pesticide that does have, a pes have some limitations, it's going to look like this. You'll see a kind of a red, brown, tannish area. You'll click on that, and it will give you a bulletin. Now, and this bulletin will have information on practices that you need to comply with to apply a particular pesticide. Now, granted, note that this pesticide use limitation area isn't forbidding you to use a pesticide. It's just requiring you to comply with um, extra measures to protect that endangered species or its habitat. As far as mitigation pick lists are concerned, how many of you are spraying Enlist? How many of you have ever seen this table before? They're not going to admit it. <laughs> well, one thing, I had this table in this presentation last year, and this table's also okay. on the label. So you should have at least seen it twice. But this is just an example of some of those pick list mitigations. And they, the pick list mitigations are really designed to reduce um, either drift or runoff. For example, depending on what type of soil type you have, you might need to get four credits or you need, may need to get six credits. If you're spraying Enlist, if you just want to make one post-emergence application, then you've already got all of your four credits. If you want to make more than one application, then two applications give you two credits, and you might need to pick something else on this list, whether it be having a cover crop in place, some sort of vegetative barrier, or even just uh, simple no-till is going to be on the list. And as a related example, I uh, mentioned last year that in 2022, the EPA was interested in reducing the aquatic ecosystem level of concern um, from 15 parts per billion to 3.4 parts per billion. Basically, uh, that would mean that it would reduce the amount of atrazine we are allowed to apply per year. Some people, right now, total atrazine, um, legal atrazine application is 2.5 pounds per year. Um, some people would be allowed to apply up to two pounds per year. Some people, everyone in this room would have to would be have to apply less than two point pounds per year so we wanted to do a study and see what happens if we have what happens to our weed control when we cut our atrazine rates so we did a field trial in delaware and at the y uh, looking at atrazine at 1.25 pints or two pints mixed with dual Zidua and Callisto. And this is what we got. Th these are the results we got from our, our Delaware study with our pre-emergence study, with our pre just pre-emergence alone 
uh, cutting those atrazine rates, mixing, again, mixing them with dual Callisto and Zidua. And these results, were, as you can see, did not look very promising. Just looking at those lower rates of atrazine and dual, we got less than 75% control of Palmer amaranth, one of our driver weed species and most concerning weed species. Same thing with lamb's quarters, morning glory, and fall panicum. Another thing I want to point out with morning glory is dual magnum espintolachlor is just not a good morning glory herbicide. It's not good on large seeded broadleaf weeds. So if you're cutting the atrazine rate and mixing it with dual or zidua to control morning glory, you're not going to get good morning glory control. Results looked a little bit better for our Queenstown study. Smooth pigweed, we had about 100% control. That's most likely because we had less smooth pigweed than Palmer and Delaware. Uh, lamb's quarters control looked good. Foxtail control looked reasonable. But again, that morning glory control. Um, without that higher rate, without that full rate of atrazine, we're just not getting great, more, getting good control of that weed. One of the things that they dis I discussed last year that they were talking about for mitigating atrazine is to maybe possibly doing a sing using it as a post-emergence application rather than a pre-emergence application. So we also looked at some other treatments with those lower rates of atrazine com combined with Halex GT or as well as comparing it to Acuron, atrazine plus Acuron GT and Halex GT. And fortunately for our post-emergence studies in Delaware, Palmer amaranth control looked a whole lot better with all of those treatments, whether, whether we used Halex GT, cut the rate of atrazine with Halex GT at 1.25 pints or about two pints, as well as um, mixing 1.25 pints of, actor, of atrazine plus Acuron GT. Got good control of Palmer. Uh, morning glory control really wasn't significantly different among all of these treatments, but we did see some slightly higher control with at that lower rate of atrazine with Acuron GT. Again, um, good results for the same stuff in our Queenstown site, smooth pigweed, lamb's quarters, foxtail, uh, morning glory in this case, a little bit better results with um, atrazine at two pints with Halex, as well as um, atrazine at one, one and a half pints with Halex compared to that uh, 1.25 pound pint rate of Acuron GT, but really there wasn't a whole lot of significant differences between these three treatments, and they all gave us about uh, 80 to 90 percent control of morning glory. So where does that lead, where does that lead us as far as resistant ma resistance management goes? Uh, I just wanted to touch brief on target site resistance versus uh, non-target site resistance. When we think about target site resistance, this is where either there's been some mutation in the enzyme that a herbicide binds to to be effective, or so much of a en particular enzyme is produced that there, is enough, it, there isn't enough herbicide to actually bind to all of those sites. When the herbicide can't bind to those sites, whatever biological function that herbicide is supposed to inhibit is allowed to continue. Now, non-target site resistance doesn't have anything to do with binding sites. Um, non-target site re resistance can happen in several ways. For example, there, the herbicide might not be, be absorbed into the plant. Um, the plant might not be, be trans, excuse me, the herbicide might not be translocated to uh, where it needs to go in the plant. The plant may appear to die, but eventually grow out of the injury. And there's also metabolism. Now, metabolism in plants, 
or detoxification in plants happens similar to what the way we metabolize toxic substance or substances or any substances that are harmful to our body. But the important thing to remember about metabolism is most of the time it's registered, or excuse me, it's regulated by a lot of different genes. And because it's regulated by many different genes, there's a, there's a potential that um, a herbicide with a plant with metabolic resistance to one herbicide will show metabolic resistance to another herbicide or metabolic resistance to a herbicide that has yet to be discovered or registered. And we haven't seen any examples of metabolic resistance in Maryland, but we have seen examples of metabolic or non-target site resistance as well as target site resistance throughout the country. And if you notice, on this, on this table, I have a lot of common herbicides that have already sh demonstrated uh, non-target site or metabolic resistance. These include glyphosate, Liberty, 2,4-D, some of your primary post-emergence products, uh, Femesifen, Reflex, <coughs> Dual, Atrazine, and Paraquat. All have demonstrated metabolic resistance. So what are we going? So what are some strategies we need to think about as far as um, staving off or mitigating herbicide resistance in the future? I like this chart because it basically gives us a good gives us a good example of you know, how resistance might increase in our field over time. So notice down here we have years, and here we have the percentage of increasing resistance. Now, in the first one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years, we can mitigate resistance. But then around year seven, eight, and nine, that's when you start to notice that, hey, I have resistant mare's tail in my field. I have resistant horseweed in my field. Um, this is really when I need to start managing for this resistant weed. Unfortunately, this chart is not really the reality of the situation. Plants are remarkable organisms, and they have a lot of genes. So there's always the possibility that there's a resistant plant in your field. Granted, it's at a very small percentage, but it's always there. So your proportion of resistance is not always zero. So as those plant, uh, so as you use the same herbicides over and over again, eventually you're going to see a steeper increase in that resistance curve. So in reality, years one, two, three, three, this area of the chart right here, this is your management phase. Because by the time you get to year seven, eight, and nine, you've already lost that herbicide. You've already lost Roundup. You've already lost 2,4-D, et cetera. So how can we, uh, so what do we do about this? So here's the same chart. Now, in the past, we've talked about rotating herbicides as a way to mitigate resistance. However, um, some new evidence has come to light as to how effective is that really going to be, given that there's always a small proportion of resistance in our field. So if we think about rotating two herbicides, herbicide A with herbicide B, what do we notice about this curve or this uh, level of resistance? Does resistance actually go down? No. We only, even by rotating these herbicides, we only get about eight applications before we're at that, this 100% resistance. Now, what rotating herbicides does is buys you time. It does not buy you number of applications. So, you know, here, by rotating, we got about 15 years and eight applications before we lost the herbicide. We're at, as opposed to not rotating, where we get to resistance in about five or six years. Again, 
buys you time with that herbicide, does not buy you extra applications with that herbicide. So what's another strategy we can use? Tank mixing. Now, tank mixing is reliant on simple math, so the probability of a plant being resistant to two herbicides is basically the product if, of it being resistant to both herbicides. So for example, you have a plant with a one in a million chance that it's resistant to herbicide A, and it has a one in a million chance that it's resistant to herbicide B, then there is a one in a trillion chance that that plant is gonna be resistant to both herbicides A and B. So by tank mixing, you're gonna decrease the, the chance that that plant is going to survive both herbicide treatments and transmit all those resistance alleles, those resistance genes to the next generation. But there are some caveats with tank mixing. One of them is being a different mechanism is required for each herbicide. You cannot mix two, group, two herbicides together and call that an effective tank mix for herbicide resistance mitigation. And they cannot be metabolized by the same enzyme, which is where that metabolic or that target site resistance comes in. Same gene or can metabolize two different herbicides. Also, for mitigation purposes, each herbicide must be effective alone and target the weed at the same uh, li life growth stage. A foliar herbicide plus a soil herbicide is not an effective tank mix for managing emerged weeds. Yes, it is a good idea to include a soil herbicide to give you that extra residual control later in the gr growing season, but for an this to be an effective tank mix, you need two foliar herbicides or two post-emergence herbicides. A half rate of herbicide A plus a half rate of herbicide B does not equal a full rate of herbicide A plus B. Uh, that those atrazine examples I showed earlier. Yes, we did get um, some good control with atrazine, but as far as looking forward into the future, does cutting that atrazine rate actually do anything to help lessen the chance that we're gonna see resistance to atrazine later on in the future? That herbicide tank mix is not, already, not effective if there's already resistance in a population. For example, mare's tail, horseweed, a lot of it is around here is glyphosate resistant. What are we using for our burn down? Glyphosate and 2,4-D or glyphosate and dicamba? The 2,4-D and the dicamba is pulling the weight of that herbicide. You are not, eventually you're going to see resistance to 2,4-D as well because the glyphosate's doing nothing to control it. And as far and similar uh, idea with soil applied herbicides, they need to have similar persistence and mobility in order to target the same individuals. For example, you have a soil applied herbicide that you know is going to last you about four weeks, and a soil applied herbicide that you know is going to last you about six weeks. By the time that four weeks is up, all your weed, that six, all your weed controls rely on that second herbicide. And to sum up here, just a few FYIs. Um, I did want to mention that we are seeing um, a lot more resistance with Italian ryegrass. We're seeing uh, resistance in uh, Pennsylvania as well as Maryland to glyphosate in Italian ryegrass. This is just an uh, image that a colleague of mine at Penn State gave where he was, he was screening Italian ryegrass populations for several with resistance to several different herbicides, and he has found at least one population that is resistant to uh, glyphosate as well as classic remsulfuron, tiofenacil, and, uh, and others. So just wanted you to be aware of that. And again, we have seen glyphosate resistance in Maryland. Um, biggest issue with um, 
herbicide resistance as far as, as small grains are concerned is we don't really have anything that's going to control Italian herbicide resistant or ALS resistant Italian ryegrass in small grains. Right now, we're pr pretty much limited to either Anthemflex or Azidua. Both of these products contain pyroxysulfone, and we're relying on pyro pyroxysulfone alone. So eventually, this is another thing that we'll probably see uh, resistance develop. As I mentioned before, we have seen some um, resistance with Italian ryegrass in uh, Maryland. This is a study I showed last year where we looked at how glyphosate, as well as tank mixtures of glyphosate and clethodim, glyphosate and sharpen, and glyphosate and uh, valor did. Um, our best result, again, from 2022 was glyphosate and clethodim, and that gave us still less than 90% control. Last summer, I did another burn down study just looking at uh, similar products, glyphosate alone, glyphosate and clethodim, glyphosate and, sap glyphosate and sharpen. We also wanted to compare that with applications of uh, Paraquat, either applied once or Paraquat applied for about 14 days apart. And for this study, the best results we got were, again, with that glyphosate and clethodim. I'm not really sure that this site actually had glyphosate-resistant Italian ryegrass, but again, be aware that, you know, if it's resistant to glyphosate, clethodim's carrying the brunt of the work. Paraquat was a good option, but we had to apply it twice. So uh, some of Italian ryegrass, Options in wheat they, and small grains are limited. Wheat, you can sp spray Zidua and Anthem Flex. You can't spray anything on barley that's going to control Italian ryegrass. Clethodim is an option again, but for how long? And a two pass Paraquat application, it works, but do you really want to have to make a two pass Paraquat application? And finally, because Jenny wanted me to mention this, a lot of you may have planted tillage radish, and we expect tillage radish to win or kill, but a lot of times it doesn't. So some of the herbicide options for controlling this include uh, 0.75 pounds of glyphosate plus a half a pound of 2,4-D, 0.7 pounds of glyphosate plus uh, 0.04 pounds of uh, tiophenacil, which is Reviton, or 0.7 pounds, 5 pounds of Paraquat, plus half, a half pound of 2,4-D, or a half pound of Dicamba. Now, when looking at doing terminating tillage radish, you really want to apply it before the flower structure reaches about four and a half inches. So here we have the life cycle of some of these brassicas and tillage radish. So you really want to apply your herbicides somewhere around here before it really starts to bolt. By the time you see flowers, it's too late. Um, so you probably want to apply it as early as possible, but just be aware of this, that the ideal temperature for spraying these translocated herbicides like glyphosate and 2,4-D is about 65 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. They'll work good in, temp in lower temperatures. They'll just work slower. If the temperature is really low, you're not going to see good results. So avoid spraying when you, you know, your nights are less than 40 degrees and your days are less than 55 degrees if you want to use these translocated products. If you're in a bind, you can probably use Paraquat Paraquat because a Paraquat relies more on the amount of sunlight than translocation. So to sum up, going forward, um, just be mindful of changes for the ESA. They're coming. The EPA herbicide plan is due on August 30th. It was due on May 24th, but they were given an extension to incorporate some of the comments that people have been made and farmers saying, like you saying, well, a lot of these practices I can't actually do on my f farm. And just be aware that 
If anybody asks you questions about the, these as far as, you know, what practices you're putting in place, what are you, what are you doing now to help mitigate um, uh, these problems with the Endangered Species Act, tell, uh, tell them. Tell them that you're using no-till. Tell them that you're already using cover crops to help um, uh, relieve some of the stress in these situations. As far as resistance management goes, just remember there's not a 0% chance that you don't have a, resistance, a resistant weed in your field. So start planning now to mitigate rather than manage resistance. Just spraying Roundup Ready beans or Roundup Ready corn or, and just ha and, or excuse me, just spraying glyphosate on those things is not going to last you for very long. And also consider these integrated tactics um, like using cover crops. Not only do cover crops suppress weeds, they also give you points on your mitigation pick list. Remember that. And Jenny already mentioned the Mid-Atlantic Weed Control Guide, so that is something you can order from Penn State if you're interested in ordering now. I have the QR code there. I don't know how well you can scan that code with those shelves there, but <laughs> I'll leave that up there for a second. And with that, I'll thank, thank you for your time and any questions? any questions? I got one. Yes. How does reduced tillage and cover crops mitigate endangered species it's it's about the runoff from the herbicide application so if you're not so if you have more coverage on the ground so, so you think we have less there's more herbicides typically with a reduced tillage operation than a uh, fully tilled farm right Yes, but a lot of these are, and a lot of these are going to be post-emergence products like 2,4-D and and dicamba. So you, again, it's ru it's runoff it's runoff mitigation. By the time we plant cover crops, the, the herbicides have all metabolized and moved out of the soil profile. And it's also about the time you apply those herbicides, and how and again how close you are to that endangered species habitat. I will be the last one in here probably looking at a pick list all day that right now. <laughs> we know that, Bill. Okay. Well, I just want people to know they're not alone. They're thinking about not looking at it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot. Yes. Yeah. And again, the, the final strategy is going to be due out hopefully later this year. And once we have that, you'll have, we'll have some more concrete information to give you next year. <laughs> Kurt, just when you were going over atrazine, nothing has changed as far as atrazine amounts for 2024. What you were reducing is just for proposals for what could be yes. in the future. Perfect. Yes, those are proposals, and as far as I know, Dave, we haven't heard anything new on the atrazine front. Thank you. Nice and quick. Hi, everyone. My name is Maureen O'Shea Fitzgerald. Um, I am with Horizon Farm Credit. However, I am a starting a new um, service that we're offering down here in Del in the Delmarva region. Um, my title is Ag Business Consultant, and we are helping farmers with their business in any way, any way that they need. So financial analysis, cash flow projections, decision making, consulting, um, grant writing, and uh, most specifically and probably most prominently, um, business planning and transition planning. Um, so we help farmers um, come up with that plan in order to, tra to transition new, uh, the next generation onto the farm or a generation off of the farm or help um, farmers with that decision to retire or, or succeed the, the farm to the next, the next generation or the next owner. So really anything with your business, um, we can help along the way. So I just wanted to let you all know that new service. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you.